Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the In 10 Years Time podcast with me, you and Blake, where we talk to up and coming athletes about how they got into the sport, where they want to see themselves in 10 years. Um, today, I'm with Villa Villa Women's women's Super League player, uh, Freya Gregory. Um, hi, hi, Freya. Thanks for sp- taking uh, some time out of your day for us. No worries. Great. Um, I'll just get started then. So, I was a 20 year old winger slash midfielder for Aston Villa and Women's Super League. So, yeah, before we start, I just wanted to know, like, where did you grow up? Like in Birmingham or in the Midlands? Like, what what was it like? Did you have any Did you have any siblings that were into sport or football? Um, yeah, I mean, I come from like the Midlands area, not kind of Birmingham, kind of just a bit north of Birmingham. Um, and yeah, very fight football and family. My dad's really into football, um, played uh, at a decent level when he was a bit younger. And then my brother is also just kind of a regular, just kind of casual, plays five a side, used to play for his local team. Um, so yeah, I come from like a really big kind of footballing family. So is that how you got into football then? Was it like through your family or was it through something else? Was it for school or was it just like a family thing? Um, I think to be honest, it was quite a casual kind of like wanted to try it out kind of thing. I think obviously I grew up going to watch my dad play and watching my brother play at football matches so yeah I wouldn't say there's any specific kind of like person or reason I started I think it was more of like a casual like want to try it and then got into it pretty quickly after that wait obviously when you did get into the villa um like academy or whatever um before you went to blues just if you could let me know like what was that feeling like not just for you but for your family because obviously that's like that's quite a that must that must have felt amazing yeah I mean at the time obviously I was pretty young I was probably maybe 11 12 and I remember going to to the trials for a few teams around because that's when they used to have that kind of trials with 30, 40, 50 girls. Um, and yeah, I just remember we're massive Villa fans as well as a family. So I think when I got, because I got a couple of offers first, I think it was from Blues, Villa and maybe Wolves or West Brom. And I think it was a pretty easy pick. Like, yeah, no, it was a great feeling. And I think my, especially my dad, massive Villa fan, was really pleased. I bet that must be, yeah. But it must be, once you had all those Midlands teams and then you had Villa, I guess, if you're a Villa fan, that's yeah. very big. So obviously you started out, you went into the Villa Academy, like you said, at 11, 12 years old. During that time when you would have been there and also um, when you were playing senior football as well, you would have been in school. Um, so I was just wondering, like, how did how did you like find balancing like school life, training, all that kind of stuff? Um, I think it probably got harder towards the end as I was kind of at the end of high school is when I started kind of being in more of a senior environment I mean it was pretty it was all right when I was in the academy and kind of in the youth age groups under 12s under 14s because it was pretty um like a, the week wasn't too full but I think towards the end when I was in last year of high school is when I started kind of being involved in the senior team and I think that's when I started noticing kind of like less sleep and like less concentration in school because I was probably tired from the night before or but yeah no it wasn't too bad until probably the end and towards like college years so that wasn't yeah. too bad. But did you so did but did you get like ever stressed out about about that? Because obviously, um obviously if the football thing doesn't go so well, then obviously you have to fall back on like school and that. So did that like stress you out a lot then? Um no, I think in a way, and my mum's a teacher, so I think that massively helped because anything that I'd miss from school or something, I'd be able to pick up at home with her, which was really good. And I think she had a massive yeah. impact on like being able to balance the two. Um but I'm quite laid back anyway, things like that. So I think for me, I kind of just knew I could only do what I could do, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so again, my mum really helped me with that. But I wasn't, I was pretty pleased to see the end of school by the time I got to kind of the last few months. So, yeah. yeah, obviously, I know you would have been, foot- doing, been doing football this time. So you would have dreamt of being a football like a lot of people. But was there anything else like academically or whatever that interested you? And you think, oh, if I don't do football, then. Yeah, you know, I think I might go into that or um probably not from school, but I'd like something that I'd always love to do. Like I think probably over the last few years I've had like a real interest in it is maybe going into like the police after football. Mm-hmm. Um coaching isn't something that I'm really like passionate about, but again, like it could change. Like, but right now it's not something that I'd like to like that I desperately want to go into. Um but yeah, like something like like the police or something like that, I think would really interest me because I think I need to be on the go all the time and like not just sat at a desk or doing something like that so yeah that's something that I'd really like to think of after football and do you think that's why you like football then because obviously like you're playing quite a few games every so often I'm a bit like that as well where I have like if I'm not doing anything then I'm I'm not really that happy like I've always got to be doing something so is that like that the same for you like you just got to be doing something active Um, yeah yeah yeah. I mean on my days off like I 
they always say like try and relax try and do something but mm. by the time it gets to about half nine ten o'clock I'm out the door and I'm doing something because I just can't be sitting doing nothing but yeah like you said definitely I think I need to be on the go all the time and just like my mind's always doing things and going everywhere so um that's probably why I've taken interest into something like that after football like you said um obviously college you didn't really like it, that was a bit more stressful and stuff but um did, did you ever, obviously, the, the college has stepped before uni. And so um, have you ever, like, obviously now I'm sure you're living the dream playing in, like, the Women's Super League and stuff and, and England and the 23s and everything. But do you ever, like, think, like, oh, if, I wish I could didn't live, like, such a strict lifestyle. I wish I could, like, go out and stuff and go to uni or, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Like, does that ever bother you? Um, I think for me it's kind of a case of, like, you don't miss something you've never had so for example like going out and stuff like I probably could count on one hand how many parties I went to when I was in high school like because Mm -hmm. I do think with this lifestyle like it's a massive word that sticks out my head is like discipline like it's such a disciplined lifestyle but the rewards you get back from it outweigh that so I think for me like it's kind of like would I actually can I miss something I've never really had so like I think it like it would be nice to experience it in some way but like in a way I feel like the rewards I get from this outweigh going out or or things like that so um again that's just how I've kind of been brought up because football's been such a massive part of my life for Mm. so long so I think that's probably why I'm in the mindset that I am in like I just don't think I can really want or miss something I've never really experienced or had is it I mean obviously I'm I'm sure you'll have plenty of friends like in the clubs as well but outside of football and stuff um like do you do you have like a big circle of friends um I have like a few from school but again like it's so it's so hard to like explain but because we're in, we're constantly in this environment like I literally spend more time with these girls at football than I do with my family like my mm. friends live within football like through England youth age groups like I've got friends all over the country which is such a blessing to have um and I think it's sometimes also hard for people outside of the environment to understand like why can't you come out tonight because it's do you know what I mean how it can like affect um that so again like I've got friends here that I would talk to about anything and rely on for anything um so I think that's kind of where I've got friends like from school and from different areas of life but I think massively for me like I'm closest to the people I work with because I'm with them 24 7 so that's kind of you said like you actually see a lot of your football mates more than like your your family or your parents or whatever like do you like I guess you don't really like miss I know this sounds bad but I guess you don't really like miss your family then because you're so used to like being away from them and going games and stuff and tournaments away from them like I don't know does it feel like that to you like do you ever miss miss them when you do um running? I think I, I obviously miss spending time with them and there's days and weekends where I'm like oh it would be really nice to have a weekend with a family or um but I think it also makes me value time with them more so I think from a very young age when going in it, uh, through England youth age groups like being away for international breaks or for a week or 10 days or even the Euros in the summer being away for almost three weeks like I think it does like it does take its toll and sometimes like in a way it's maybe a blessing in disguise because I value the time with them more when I do get the time with them so occasionally like if we have a Saturday game and then we have the Sunday off that's I, that's one of the best days of the week because it's just like a nice Sunday that I've I probably used to have when I was younger with my family so I think that's kind of how that works out for me in a way. You've been in the football system for such a long time, even though you're only 20 and you've played really, played really well, obviously. Like, I know I'm sure you get lots of people giving you your praises, right and rightfully so. I've asked a couple of people in this podcast, like, how do they respond to like um, people like bigging them up? Because some people, well, most of the ones that I've spoken to, they're a bit, uh, they feel like a bit awkward whenever like someone's praising them and I don't know they just don't feel they obviously they welcome it but it's it's a bit of a weird feeling like is that the same for you like when you have people f- um, praising you saying how good you are and stuff like how how do you take that and does it make you feel awkward um I think it's funny you say that because I think um last night actually my friend from school I haven't spoke to in years actually messaged me and just said like I can see how like we can all see how far you've come and like how hard you've worked to to get where you are today and I think sometimes moments like that like kind of hit because it's like sometimes I think you're so caught up in the lifestyle every day that you forget like what you've done to get to this point so I think in a way I kind of get when people say it's kind of like it's almost like when people say it's hard to take a compliment like when people are telling you good things about yourself but I also think for me like it's it's nice to hear it from those sorts of people because I think it's a massive part of my life like this is what I've worked for like I get it when people are like oh it's kind of awkward when people like complimenting you and things which I kind of agree to an extent but I also think it's like it's what drives you in a way 
to make other people happy and like my family when they say they're proud of me or whatever like that's what I strive to do is to make my family proud so yeah that's kind of my sense moving into like your like your footballing like um journey, journey now and stuff so um obviously uh you said that your family like or your dad especially is like a big Villa fan when you left um Villa to go to the Birmingham like youth set up like how did that go because <laughs> obviously um... like, there's a bit of a strong difference between those two clubs um it was interesting I think I'd be lying if I said at the time it wasn't the right thing to do because it was I think the, the direction that Blues were moving in and um, they'd been kind of sitting top four or five in the WSL for the last couple of years so I think for my own development in a in a selfish way I think it was definitely the right thing to do um but yeah it wasn't it wasn't brilliant bringing mm-hmm. all, that, all the kit back when I've gone to get the kit for the start of pre-season and stuff like um not sure where that kit is right now but <laughs> maybe my dad's thrown it out but um no and like everyone knows the rivalry between the two clubs like it's massive and I think like I did kind of have to just put that to the side to be selfish in a way and just and acknowledge the fact that it probably was the right thing at the time but I'm definitely happier to be back in a villa shirt now okay that, that's, that's good then um so yeah so did you feel like any pressure like when so when you put on when you did put on the blue shirt like what was that like and even when you like if you played against villa like that must have been a pretty weird feeling for you like to be playing against your family team or your team but you're wearing that arch rival shirt and you're playing yeah. in the rival stadium like I'm just wondering like what that what that must have felt like because that was I mean weird. for when I so when I was at Blues it was kind of like the academy age group so more like under 21s um and I think it was just kind of a it was weird because I'd play the game and then I'd go to watch Villa men play and it was all a bit and I remember actually getting told off once by them because I was still young at this point but I was kind of um in the first team but kind of not kind of just floating around I remember like liking a few things on Twitter about Villa's goals at the weekend and I got pulled in by the media team um to say that look you can't you can't do that but I just found it really hard like there was times where I was like like because obviously whatever shirt you put on you try and you work your, your the yeah. hardest for like, yeah. whatever. I do think I was probably happy when the opportunity came and when I saw the the direction Villa was moving and I think it was kind of oh, not a relief I think that's the wrong word because Blues when I was there I got my WSL debut with them like they it was a massive step in zone of my career. But yeah. um yeah, definitely happier to to be back in a villa shirt. And before you did join Blues, did you have any or uh, do you have any other like offers or was it just a case or and if you did, like was it just a case of you staying somewhere like local, like in the Midlands, like in Birmingham? Or did have you ever been tempted to like move outside of Birmingham or the Midlands uh, another team yeah. somewhere else in the country? I mean, at that age it's like it's difficult because it's kind of like at yeah. in the under 21s nobody's like like contracted so it's almost mm-hmm. like you can have like other clubs like I had other clubs like speaking and asking about me to to parents because at this point I don't think I had an agent at this point um so there was clubs like down south and things like that but I think for me at that point I was at college like I was kind of um tied down in a way so I could only yeah. really go so far so I think that's probably why when the opportunity came and at the time, obviously, Blues in the WSL, like, I think that was quite attractive, um, take away the badge. But, like, I think you, you're kind of limited in what you can do at that age because of education and things. So that's probably why I stayed local. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Avoid avoid the stress for sure. Um, obviously, you made your top flight debut, so the WSL debut um, at 17, I think, when I was when I was doing research, um, which is crazy. Obviously, when you were, you were that young, did you have a lot of players... Um, like some more senior players in the team uh, that looked out for you and if they were if you could name them that'd be great and like what did they do to like look after you and all, all the other younger players yeah so I well my debut quite came quite unexpectedly I think it was a late like late injury in the week Um, and I kind of just got chucked in and I, again I think in a way that was probably the best way to have had it because I didn't have time to stress about it it was like you're in and then that's it Um. And at the time I had, I think it might have been Chloe Arthur was there, who obviously was at Villa after, this was at Birmingham, so she came to Villa as well. I had Chloe Arthur, Hannah Hampton was obviously in there at the time. Um, there was a couple of other younger players, I think Laura might have might have been there. I'm not 100% sure. But um, yeah, there was there was, there was was quite a lot of people there that were, that were very supportive about it. And like I said, like I think in a way, it coming so late on was quite good because I probably... I think I was probably ready, but maybe not ready for the, the start. And, you know, I, I could affect the game, but I don't think I would. I was in. I remember the feeling of kind of like 
the game kind of passing me by okay. rather than actually affecting the game, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but no, there was, I remember Chloe Arthur, I've got a really good relationship with Chloe. Like, I think she was probably one that sticks out for me and she was playing right back and I was playing right wing at the time. And yeah, Hannah, Hannah was obviously there and she was young, but she was experienced at the time. So that's the two that probably stick out. Obviously, since you've been at, I mean, I guess this question can go for both Blues, um, Birmingham and, and Villa. But like, obviously there's a whole thing with like, online abuse and stuff that you get on social media and stuff um every, everyone can get it for a variety of reasons and obviously none of them are right um it's all it's all terrible but i'm just wondering like how have the clubs that you've been at like how have they helped a young young female players like yourself um and just general female players like how to deal with that kind of like um that potential abuse um that you could potentially get um yeah, yeah. i think I think at Birmingham it was probably a bit different because I was upcoming. I wasn't really fully, I wouldn't say I was probably fully established in the team. So I can think that was probably kind of put to the side because I was really young, wasn't really in it. But at Villa, they're very quick to act on it. Like if you feel uncomfortable about anything, there's different people you can go to about it. Um, luckily, I don't think I'm, like there's not not been too much that I've felt uncomfortable about. And if I have, like I've most of the time just either ignored it or not even look, like chose to look at it. But mm. um, they're definitely like just quick to act on it and, anything that makes us feel uncomfortable they they know what to do and the right steps to take with it so I think that's really important especially in modern day football and where the women's game's going is that this stuff is unfortunately becoming more common Mm -hmm. um even over the last kind of two two three years I think it's definitely as the game gets more attention you get a lot of more positive attention from the game there's also a negative side to it Um, yeah so but no the club definitely take the right steps and they act really quickly on it so do you think like um because I watched a, like a podcast or interview thing you did with this guy, Holt B6 or something. Yeah. Um, so do you think that the met whole like mental side um, of football is that's just as important as like whether you can, I don't know, um, like how much you run in a game or like all the statistical side of stuff. Like how much do you think the mental side um, for, men and, for men and women's uh, football plays into players' abilities? I'd argue it's probably more important. I think yeah. like psychologically, the psychological part of the game is absolutely huge, especially with, with like modern day football and how it's as how social media can affect you and things like that. But even just like your mental strength is so important as much as like I'd say argue more than the physical strength, because I think you can have all the attributes and the the talent and the the physicality and the technical tactical kind of intelligence. But if you don't have the mental strength or mental capabilities to cope with modern day football, I think that's where it can massively hinder the like, heights you go to and the lengths you go to to get to where you want to be. But um, yeah, definitely, I think it's absolutely huge, which I think as well, why psychological support and um, people you can talk to and support around you is so important. So I really would argue that it's more, it's more important than any of the physical stuff. Yeah, I, I think it is as well, because I'm, like, I mean, like any, any, like any sport, um, they are quite often they'll have psychologists and stuff. And some even like the top, top players, they'll even have like their own like, psychology team or whatever like I know a lot of boxers have that so obviously you've been at uh, Villa and Blues but you've also been at Leicester as well for the 29-20 season I mean I'll, I'll go on to the COVID thing but before that like how much did um before the lo- before the lockdown and all that kicked off how much did that loan spell do you think help in terms of like your development in terms of like getting regular game time and all that stuff um for me it was absolutely huge I think it's a massive time in my career like so far um I think probably towards like the end of the first half of the season before I went on loan, it was kind of a a moment in where I had to kind of accept, even though I, I love this club and I love playing here, I needed to play. And I think as much as people, football is a team game, it's a team sport, but you, sometimes you have to be selfish. And I think at that moment I was like debating in my head, like I, I, I had to accept the fact that I wasn't playing and I wasn't, and I needed to play and I needed to go and get those minutes somewhere. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to probably arrive at the time that Lydia Bedford obviously got appointed as manager. Um, so I think that really helped because I had a, a friendly face there that I knew um, who coached me through youth age groups at England. So she knew me as a person and as a player. But yeah, massively important to me. I think it really helped me um, and gave me the exposure that I needed before coming back into pre-season at Villa. I mean, and I guess it was in Leicester. So again, that's not too far from Birmingham. No. I think it's yeah. only like an hour, hour's journey on the train or whatever. 
Um, so then obviously when the pandemic did hit, I mean, I've, I've asked, um, I spoke to Luke Matson, who's a Wolves player about this as well. Just interested to hear what you think, how you felt at the time of COVID when you're at Leicester and you think, oh, yeah, I'm actually getting really good game time now. And then it comes and it screws everything up, basically. Like, what was that time like for you? Well, COVID kind of like the main lockdown hit probably just before that. That was probably when I was starting to get into like the first year environment at Villa. So that was annoying, okay. but I also think it gave me an opportunity to, like it kind of relates to how I thought about my injury pre- just that I've just had. It's like, it's an opportunity to get stronger and fitter and there's not much more you could do in that lockdown mm. other than run. So I think I spent most of my days running and getting fit. Um, nice. Which again, when we came into pre-season that, that season, I probably was the fittest I'd ever been coming into a pre-season. So I think for me, that's the positive I took from it. And it also cancelled my college year out, so I do wasn't oh, playing too much. So yeah. yeah. No, um when it hit, I think I was in year 13, so second year of sixth form. And yeah, and they're like, and I, I'm if there's one good thing to come out of COVID, it's like I didn't have to do like some that those exams I got given my yeah. grades. So I guess that helped in a way. It saves me stress yeah. symptoms. Um uh so obviously as well as um WSL you've been playing for England at youth level play for under 17s under 19s now under 23s as you get gradually closer to the senior team um does it feel like any better each time you get moved up the age groups of England or does it feel the same like does it feel just as good each time um I think probably over the last few months seeing girls that I've played with in the 23 so like someone Katie Robinson made it to see Jess Park, Emily Ramsey, like seeing them step up, I think it in your head is like, it's not too far away. Obviously mm. it's a massive, a massive like um, thing being called up to the seniors and it's a massive privilege, but I do think it, it's kind of like there is a pathway there and there's proof of it. Mm. So I think that for me is massive and like seeing obviously our um, under 19s Euro squad that went to the finals in the summer, I think seeing some of them come through to the 23s now, um, again just shows there's a very clear pathway to the seniors and I think it's it's credit to like the staff that work in the FA because it's um it shows there's opportunities there if if given kind of um the hard work and dedication it's like there's an opportunity there so I think that's massive for me seeing people like Kate Robinson and Jess Park who are who I've been on camp with like I'm good friends of some of them like I think that's massive because it's there's a clear opportunity and pathway there. When you talk about the pathways like do you think that's the reason why um, English football uh, for, for women is doing so well at the moment um, because obviously I know uh, Sarah Reedman's done an amazing job since she came into the senior uh, England team as manager but when you talk about that pathway like do you think that's why in just England women's just doing so well at the moment because it's a clear like path to success almost for all these young players like yourself yeah there's a clear path to to get opportunities there but I also think there's so much depth like there's so much talent within English football, like women's football. Um, and you see that from like the, the uh, competition at 23s, at 19s, 18s, like all the way through. There's always been depth, there's always been competition. I think that's credit to the academies and the RTCs and and the clubs and the championship and, and the WSL. I think there's so much competition that it's it supplies so much depth. So there's so many good players to choose from. And I also think for the players themselves, it pushes them to work hard. It pushes me to work harder because I can see the competition around me. Mm. Um and it's only going to get stronger. And it's definitely got stronger. Like the league's got stronger over the last year, two years, three years. Yes. So yeah, I think that's massive. Yeah. Um, so like you said, you mentioned the academies. Like what is it? Is it like they're, they're, is it what they're teaching you? Is it um, like the nutrition side of things? Is it like they're putting more investment in like the whole thing around you aside from the football thing? Is that is that what you mean when you're talking about? Um, yeah, I think the investment's massive. But I also think the like... I think it's very easy to just focus on the football, but I think there's a massive like kind of thing around like everything, like like you said, like nutrition, like psychological support, all these things and the professionalism around it has definitely improved even since I was probably in, in RTC Academy a, a good like four or five years ago. Um, so I think that's massive. I think there's, because there's very obvious, a very obvious opportunity for a career in women's football now, I think the professionalism of the academies and RTCs is only just getting stronger because there's a very clear kind of pathway to professional football. See, I just think the the focus on everything 
around the football itself yeah it's having a massive positive impact uh just a couple just a couple more questions um i saw a article on bbc sport um it's like an interview with emma hayes and she was talking about like the diversity in women's football and she's like when she's been at chelsea like a, a lot of the home although chelsea's in london a lot of the homegrown players or whatever they come they're often come from surrey you don't really you know often get them from any, anywhere else like i was wondering like um do you think that's a that's another that's a prob that's a problem in like the women's game at the moment is getting uh girls uh young women from all different backgrounds um into it um from your from your from your point of things and um if it is then, like what, what what do you think needs to be done or what can be done to like make sure that as many girls as possible uh, in the country can get involved i think it's hard to just kind of like give like a a solution to a problem that's probably widespread but I also think it's just about giving opportunities and uh, the support mm -hmm. and the professionalism around RTCs all around the country so I think that's I think it's it's quite hard to say but I just think it's about um opportunities support support always comes like that's the word that kind of comes to my mind is just support in every aspect and then um, just giving everyone a fair opportunity and to to make a career out of it so that's kind of what I think about it uh, just to go, I forgot to ask you this. Um, just before, um, when I just spoke about um, like whether Weigman's had uh, how well she's done. Has she like obviously you're you of England under twenty threes? Like how involved is she with like the under twenty threes? Does she not? Is it just like Mo Marley? Like is it just is it completely different? Uh, like the coaching setup, or is like how involved is like Weigman in getting young girls into the senior team? Because also, I think England women was going in the right direction anyway, but since she's been in, I just feel like England women's just elevated to a whole other level. So, yeah. um, I think for us as players, it's difficult because we're probably quite pretty focused on what we're doing on the pitch and around around that. But I know there's a clear communication between the staff at the 23s and the staff at um, the seniors. So I think that's massive as well. Like there's, they all know each other. They've got a good relationship. They speak. So I think as well, the players that are at the seniors, obviously some of them will be in environments with the 23s and um that's probably massive as well um okay. just the communication's clear and there's a very clear relationship between the two nice um one last question i always ask my guess this um at the end of each episode um obviously this podcast is called in 10 years time so i'm going to ask you fair gregory it's uh 28th of february today um imagine yourself in 2033 where you'll be uh 30 um 30 29 um so yeah, I know that seems a bit a bit scary to think of now, but um, yeah, like where would you like to see yourself in ten years' time? Like, what do you want to achieve by that point? Um, I think for me, just playing, just reaching my potential, um, playing my best football, like playing regularly, ideally for for Villa, like it's my team, it's my club, um, and also just internationally, like going to a major tournament, um, establishing myself on the international stage and the, with the biggest and best players. So I think for me, that's just reaching my potential is like the first thing that comes to my head yeah so re reaching your potential just as long as you can do the best you can um yeah. then that's that's all that's happy but yeah that's yeah. that's fair enough fair enough um thank you fair thank you so much for taking a time out of your day for us been really yeah. good to talk to you been an excellent guest yeah thank, thank you very much thank you thank you for your time thank you